that YouTube's one hour restrictions now on things that are assembled really kind of hamper me. I try to stay right around an hour with most videos, although obviously the rules ones I probably would be a poster child for why they implemented that rule. <laughs> Some of them go to two and a half hours and I don't realize. Oh, okay. So, you may have different pieces to a command unit, which is to say there might be cavalry charges, stuff like that going on that happen at different times in the game. And regardless of the, hey, you have to activate one all at once, um, <laughs> that doesn't really work. <laughs> Because there's a sequence of play. <laughs> and I don't think that you violate that. So let me check how this is set up here. Yeah, all cavalry belonging to the active side has to be done at once. Then the movement and fire combat, etc. So... Their rules kind of don't really work. <laughs> it, 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 see, the problem is it's holdovers because I think the original game was I go, you go. Then there was a straight chip pull design, and now there's this kind of bastardization that, you know. And obviously, you can mod it if you decide, yeah, I want to go with straight chip pull. I can do that. Or straight I go, you go. I can do that. Although that's harder just because of the uh, special segments. I'd have to dig up old rolls for that. Which I have. Okay. Uh, light Cavalry. So Commanders of Light Cavalry. And how well are they marked? Well, it says CP Command Chart at the back of the Special Rules book. Hey, it finally tells me where it is. So something should have this CP self-activating. So this sucker, for example would have that capability. And what is done is after you've placed all your maneuver units and defined them somehow. And by the way, uh, as someone who I guess is more familiar with the game did mention on one of my videos, I can't comment on my videos. I, I'm done with that. You want to talk to me, go to TGB. Uh, anyway. Um, that these core markers are essentially activation maneuver unit markers and there's no differentiation between them and that kind of explains why hey there's no old guard counters and stuff like that uh, they're just there to confuse you and this is especially bad because well I guess it's no worse like the sixes and nines um, the nine, the nines and eleven in in here are going to be confusing because you can flip them either way and they look the same. <laughs> just to just to make sure things don't. Now that actually doesn't matter though, because it doesn't matter what unit you draw out of the cup. It's not a pure chip pull system. But if you wanted to make this usable as a pure chip pull system, you would have to draw some lines under those counters. You don't have to do it with these, although you're probably gonna have to draw lines under all of these or, well, there is a differentiation, which is that the nines are on the front side of these counters and the sixes are on the back. And so you can tell by the beveling. Uh, anyway, how do you check? You check his cavalry melee bonus. And, 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 and I mean, this is it here. This is the kind of shit. After all CPs have been generated, the initiative of a light cavalry leader is his cavalry melee bonus. If he has a printed cavalry melee bonus of three, then his initiative is three. Yeah, I fucking needed that, right? This bonus, regardless of what is printed on the back of the cavalry leader counter, may never exceed five or be less than one. Okay, they needed to tell me that. Thus, okay, now, thus a leader with no printed cavalry melee bonus will have an initiative. <laughs> oh, God. Likewise, a leader with a bonus of six will be treated as if they have. Do you really need to do this? 
This makes the rules incomprehensible to me. It really does. I absorb nothing when you fucking keep saying inane shit that I don't need to read. Uh, a single die is roll, rolled in the, and, and the old rules have this too, at least the older ones that I have. Maybe, maybe if you go back to like, you know, the Marshall Enterprises 70s rules or whatever, they still make them. Um, maybe those rules are clearer. I don't know. But these, it's like you've got somebody who's fucking on pot while he's writing them, who's just like continually going on and on. <laughs> kind of like my reviews. And no, I don't smoke. Um, a single die is rolled and the leader passes his check of the die result. This is what I need to know. Equal to or less than his initiative. Thank you. Now he gets an MU counter and his duplicates put in the cup just as if you had paid for it. Now we have restrictions here. If he's given a command elsewhere, uh, sorry, if he's part of a division or corps, he may not check for initiative if he's in command space. <laughs> And you can't check until you spend all your MUs. Administrative march orders. This allows you to um, create an MU with one command point and designate where you want to go. And that MU no longer goes into the cup. What happens is it'll be activated with your other ones, or maybe there's a special chip for it. I think there's maybe a special chip for, for all of these. And you just keep heading towards that location. So you don't have to spend command points at every turn to regenerate that command. You make it once. That's kind of nice. Um, and you have to, all, all kinds of detailed stuff about, you know, not being able to run out of your command range when you're under them. Okay, the four action chips, which also get thrown into the cup. And basically, if you recall, um, what you're going to be doing is you draw from the cup, and if you get one of the players, all that player's commands move. They do everything for their turn. And the rest of their chits mean nothing. Uh, but if you pull one of these, uh, that takes place. So you get a little bit of randomization. Now, for whatever reason, the bigger the battle... Uh, I guess it just maintains a distribution. It, it's really not a big deal. But you have no idea, basically, where things are going to go. So, what is the distribution? No, there, there is a difference in distribution, right? Um, so, for example, if I have a tiny battle where I only have a maneuver unit on each side, then I'm putting two maneuver units in the cup, and I still can't tell too much of what's going to happen, but the more commands are in the cup, the more likely that a player is going to go before any of these special actions. So in the big battles, all the special actions will get um, shifted to the end of the turn, and they'll pretty much be automatically at the end of the turn. You won't know the order that they're going to come in. There's some chance they might not, but you can almost guarantee that they will come at the towards the end or at the end of the turn. But if it's a small battle where there are only a couple of maneuver units on the board, then it's more likely that those things will come up early, and you have a more chaotic battle. Uh, does that make sense? Not really. I don't know what's being intended to. I don't know what the intention of representing the game this way is. I. <laughs> I the only thing I can guess is that um, when the chip pull was originally done, originally done and these were thrown in as, yeah, well, instead of just having chip pull and having these segments at the beginning or end of the turn as we would, why don't we throw them in randomly and add a little bit of mixing up? And then to maintain the same proportionality that you would get under those rules, the decision was made to keep all the chits in here um, so that you have this weird variability based on the size of the battle as to how random things are. But things should be pretty predictable with a battle this size, or 
honestly, most of the back games are pretty big. So I, 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 <laughs> you're not going to see too many postcard games. But there are scenarios that are very small in which it's totally random where those shits come up. And that's, I just don't, I don't get what that's meant to represent. Okay. So what do we have here? So our special shits... Um, The leader chit allows you to move any leaders that aren't part of a maneuver unit. The regroup chit allows you to move units that are out of command, essentially, but not adjacent to the enemy, to try to get back into command. Uh, they can't really fight. They're allowed to change. No, they're allowed to change facing and formation, but not if they're in an enemy zone of influence. Yeah, so I guess if you're being attacked from the rear, you just stand there and keep taking it. If you're not in command, your local commander isn't smart enough to fix that. Um, artillery can change its formation. I limber, non limber. The artillery shit. So this is going to affect the grand battery. And any mortars, howitzer, and artillery batteries, yeah, I'm sorry. It affects only the grand battery and the bastions. There are bastions in the old stat up here, but I don't think those are the redoubt guns. I'm not sure what the restrictions on them are. Um, maybe they're part of this too. But the bastions in the old stat can only fire in this phase. Grand Battery gets to fire in two different phases. It's one of the advantages of creating a Grand Battery. Let's make sure. Bastion guns of the all set. However, there's a bonus fire round for Prussian Howitzer Battery and Grand Batteries on the field of battle who may also fire offensively and defensively. Okay. So, so I don't know how this is set up. So this says only mortars comma, howitzers and artillery batteries belonging to the Grand Battery. Mm. Uh, but then later, Prussian howitzer batteries and Grand Batteries uh, may fire. So I think the mortars, I think these may be mortars. It would make sense that, but they, I, I can't tell any reason to believe that they're mortars. So I don't know. You know, but some guns, and we'll try to figure out what they are when we play. <laughs> it's, again, I don't think it's reflected over here in the images of different artillery. We have no kind of indication of what the differences are. They all are pictured that way as far as I know. Uh, but maybe I'm, or maybe I'm wrong. Um, let's look at the Prussians, since they have some special ones. <laughs> okay, so howitzers have this little dinker sticking out of them. And we don't know if they have to be part of the grand battery to count. And it doesn't look like there's many of them, and I will never be able to see this. So we can ignore that. No special rules with howitzers. <laughs> because we will simply not be able to read that. And what are others? Mortars. Okay, we have these bastion guns and redoubts, and those don't say what they are. So, uh, my guess is mortars don't actually exist unless somebody defines them somewhere. <laughs> yeah, this is how you face these wolves, or how I face them. You really can't expect what you expect out of a normal board war game, even a monster, even a complex game. Uh, certainly I've played more complex tactical games than this, and I have found them to have clear rules where this just has a muddled fucking mess. A drug-induced uh, nightmare. Okay. Um, the reinforcement chip. Uh, this allows units and leaders scheduled to enter uh, to come on the board. And then once they're on the, on the board, 
then and completely on the board um, then they start acting under the normal administrative rules but I don't need to use a command unit to move things on the board now we don't know what that means with things like this we haven't figured out what this is intended to represent so this is units that in Dresden specific rules are off board and they're not activated until this moment but uh, maybe they come on the board and stay inactive or maybe they're inactive and off the board and not marked as reinforcements because you can run off the board with a leader and wake them up uh, or maybe there's some other reason that <laughs> they're not represented the same way the French are as reinforcements and the other allied units there's a whole bunch that are just available to come in after 3 p.m which again is just kind of like okay what's up with that shit um we'll figure that out <laughs> and as of right now we'll swap batteries and probably be done for the night this is going to take me probably a week to get through the roll book i mean it took me three or four days to set up this sucker and I probably don't have it set up correctly. Well, we know I don't have it set up correctly because I can't stack this artillery with the infantry, but maybe we'll find out that I'm wrong about that. <laughs> or maybe I'll just forget about it and not worry. Okay, let's see if we can get a little bit of, <coughs> of the game in so I can justify having a cigar and some chocolate milk today. And yeah, this is gonna be tremendously slow going. Okay, so we have a lot of rules on facing here. And in general, it's what you would expect. But the problem is facing here is towards the vertex. And you'll see this in the bar rules too. Towards the vertex and a few other games, uh, Great Battles of History as well. Facing is towards the vertex when you're in line formation and towards a hex side when you're in column. Again, another factor like this two hex spreading out. That causes it to be kind of painful and hard uh, to prevent things from getting kind of bumped out of position. So, yeah, these calves are all in line. Um, and we may find that I've made some mistakes in setup. Feel free to tell me, but, uh, you know. Uh, basically, you can only move into directions that you're facing. Um, all the units in a hex have to face in the same direction. And you have these kind of uh, here. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't see a cost for change of facing. Let's see. A change of orientation can be done with regroup or when it's in the act of moving. Um... I don't think there's any cost for facing changes in this. Oh, wait, hold on. The, the way the rules are all very wordy means it's hard to find these things. Uh, if you at, begin movement with a... Okay. You may... Okay, you can change your facing as long as you have movement potential available. I.e. if you haven't spent all your movement points, you can change your facing. It doesn't actually cost any movement points. And what this means is you can't swing into a hex and turn to face the enemy, is basically. And that's pretty much what all of this ends up saying. You get some uh, advantages for assaulting into a flank or rear hex side. Uh, I don't see one on fire. There may be additional effects for fire. You would expect there to be morale effects or whatever but I don't see it there. You basically get a multiplier um, double if you're hitting a flank and hitting a rear hex side you only get half again 50% uh, 1.5 times the value. Um, I guess the idea there being that you could about face uh, with some of the rear facing uh, companies or whatever and present you know your full combat capability there but if you're getting hit in the flank you're really you're getting in and and all kind of bad stuff starts happening 
you have zones of, zone de influence instead of zone of control. And of course they have to call it Z little d uh, apostrophe I as the, yeah. again, you know, there's a common language for war games and a game this complex, there's no reason for it not to follow that common language. And that language is not a French one. Even in French games, I see Zone of Control and ZOC showing up in them. Uh, okay. What do we have? Um, who has them? Uh, so this is going to allow you Opportunity Fire or an Opportunity or Reaction Charge. And... So far, we don't bother defining it right up front as to where it is. Okay, all active units, they can be target of a fire attack. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so they don't actually specify what, where it happens, I don't think. Um, my guess is it's... Oh, here, they, they do. <laughs> And they're very parsimonious in their language. Okay. So, yeah, whatever hexes count as front by your facing, I'll give you one. Um, so, limbered artillery and foot infantry. Uh, I'm sorry. In, yeah. Limbered foot artillery. Uh, of course, that instead of saying foot artillery, it's limbered artillery a pied. Let's throw some random French in there for no good reason. Uh, and... Infantry have to stop when they enter a zd. Um, they can leave, but only if they're stacked with a leader. So you just got to stand and take fire if, uh, if you don't have a leader to tell you to get out of there. Uh, and they can't immediately enter another, uh, we're going to call them zones of control. Although that'll confuse us. Trailleurs, that's the word for skirmishers. You see this actually showing up in uh, the Viva Lamper, too. Just to confuse people. Um, they're allowed to voluntarily exit, even without a leader. But they do trigger opportunity fire or charges when doing so. Hmm. I don't remember that being the rest of the normal rule. At least that's not the impression I got from it. So this is the area in which our infantry and artillery may uh, initiate artillery fire, or in which when an enemy unit enters an area that can be affected by a reactive unit is considered to have entered its zone of influence. The impression here is that's when the normal fires happen. However, the impression from the skirmisher rule is that they trigger opportunity fire when they leave. I highly doubt that's what's intended, but that's how these rules get written. Cavalry and artillery, uh, horse artillery, uh, can voluntarily move through a zone of influence, but they trigger opportunity fire for each zone exited belonging to infantry or artillery. Hmm. Okay, let's look. Yeah, this is really interesting because uh, these last two seem to indicate exiting, but here... It doesn't specify clearly. When an active unit enters an area that can be affected by a reactive unit is considered to enter its zone of influence. That really sounds like the opposite. I'm going to settle on one of these two. I don't know which. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a, some sketch ideas of, of, for a game. Of course, it's been around for uh, 40 years now, right? <laughs> but it's still in that sketch idea phase. God. All right. Uh, zone the influence and opportunity fire. We already, uh, any operate, any action performed that requires an expenditure of movement will trigger the uh, few de chance. Yeah. It's opportunity fire here. It's few de chance here. That again. Or opportunity charge. Why isn't it not charge de few or few de charge or I don't know. No, charge de chance. I don't know. Um, at the reactive player's option. A unit changing facing, for instance, does not expend movement points doing this, and it doesn't trigger it. 
<sighs> I get the feeling it's always when you leave. But again, it's not... The, the only places where it's very clearly stated is on exiting. Um, anyway. Tactical organizations. Maybe it's time to leave. I think I've done enough for today. <laughs> And, and here, I mean, they're even walking away from kind of the minis uh, terminology. Instead of using formation, they use tactical organization, you know? <laughs> okay. Um, interesting things here. Column and line can only be formed in clear terrain. If you're not in clear terrain, and I think this green is clear. I think that's uh, just an elevation indication. But if you're not in clear terrain, you're in general order, which, whatever. Um, and what's important here really is, let me see if I can find them. We have a stacking chart, which gives how many increments, um, which is sort of the strength points in other games, of units that you're allowed of points of units that are allowed to be stacked in that formation but you're given options like 18 increments or a regiment or three skirmish i think that's three skirmish increments but i'm not sure uh, it may be just three units that are in skirmish we can see later uh, in these other locations, you're going to be in open order, though. Now, uh, so if you're in column, you use your full movement potential. If you're in line, you're going to have more firepower. And we'll explain where the firepower comes from. I think it is actually here. So in melee, all increments are added up. Um, for the pre morale, for the pre assault morale check, and all the melee units in the stack for defense and a, uh, an assault, unless you're in a structure, in which case, or you're attacking a structure. Only the top unit in the column, however, fires, and it uses the fire strength printed on the back of the unit. Uh, I don't remember which number that is. I think it's the top number. You can look that up. You know, that's. There's, you know, these usual, yeah, that's the fire value. So that's the in-column fire value. Yeah. Uh, when you're in line, you're also only allowed in clear terrain. Up to 18 increments can be in a single hex. However, um, when you're in a very large group in line, you're actually considered to be almost in column, a set of lines, um, one behind the, well, several wide and several deep, <laughs> as it were. Uh, infantry are allowed to be in line uh, between two hexes, as we mentioned already. <clears throat> And then the increments will be split between those hexes. But you have to have at least five increments in order to deploy across two hexes. And honestly, you really don't want to be spread that thin. But from what, you know, not that I'm used to the game. But <laughs> uh, However many increments there are, if it's greater than four, only the top four increments of a unit can fire. I think that's of a stack can fire. And uh, let's see where we got this. The combat of a few. Well, they say see this, and I don't see too much that has to do with that. We get a, a ratio and we roll some dice. Hmm, okay. And a ratio seems kind of weird here. Uh, all, uh, a maximum of four increments can be used. All printed melee strengths per stack of units in line are used for melee, however. A unit in line in two hexes has its melee value split between the hexes. Um, it'll also have its fire value based on how many 
increments are in each space. So if you only have a five uh, increment unit, you'll have three in one hex and two in the other. Uh, but the assault is treated as one melee, even if you are using uh, from two different hexes. Even if you're attacking adjacent hexes containing same or different enemy units. Uh, okay. So for maneuver, you lose two points when you're in the line. You lose two points from your basic movement potential. And then they give a lot of example here. Um, you pay for the most expensive terrain you move through. So here you're going to pay for the slope, even if only half the unit crosses the slope. We're pretty used to that. Uh, you might be doing a wheeling maneuver or something, in which case only one half of the unit is maneuvering. They both make a facing change, but yeah. Uh, okay. So general order is if you're not in clear terrain. And the stacking limitations are again going to be determined off of this stacking chart. If you move from clear terrain to non-clear terrain, you get a free formation change into general order. <coughs> when you exit non-clear terrain, you have to pay for the formation change cost. Hey, what's that? Well, hopefully we'll see. Sometime. And then we have one of those in other words. Uh, and a summary. I mean, you know, if a simple rule like this requires a summary, and the summary is basically the rule, something's being done wrong. Uh, eh, all right. In general order, all melee increments are totaled for the pre-assault morale check, all melee strength for the defense and assault, except for special structures. Units defending in general order don't have to make a pre-morale uh, pre morale check. Only the top unit in a stack in general order is allowed to fire, and it uses the strength just as if it's in column. A square is formed only in clear terrain, and you have to have infantry, or infantry with artillery stacked with it. Um, what you're going to have is up to the 18 increments, and uh, you don't need a leader for units to join an existing square. Now this is all worded weird if I recall correctly. A unit may join another unit already in square, however units may not stack prior to forming square without the presence of a leader. Okay, that doesn't make sense, so of course we have it in other words, which probably might explain it all, or maybe just wanders around some more. For units uh, to stack in a square, a unit must have first formed square and the other units moved to it. Okay. Infantry entering a square would still require the unit to change formation into square, thus the infantry would pay a movement point entering the square and another movement point changing from formation into square. Uh, when you're in combat, you total everything for the pre-melee assault check. It doesn't say morale check, but I think that's what they mean. All melee values are totaled for defense. A uh, square, yeah, again, let's use French here, just uh, may fire into non-adjacent hexes as shown by this diagram. And I guess it's just these three hexes for some. Okay, so the way it actually works is you pick a hex, if you fire into one hex, you can't fire into an adjacent hex. Um, but you can fire into the three hexes defined by the one hex that you fire into. And because of the way the square is going to be oriented, because of course, you know, it would obviously be as a square sitting in a hexagonal uh, location going to be divided into three segments. <laughs> You're allowed to fire into three of those hexes. Yeah, I don't get it either, but whatever. And your fire strength is going to be divided by three. Um, when you make a fire, you're allowed to fire into all three of those hexes essentially at once. It'll have zones of influence. Cav and horse artillery can push through it, but they can trigger fire. 
Uh, infantry and foot artillery have to stop when entering it just like with anything else. In order to melee a, a square, uh, the enemy must actually rest in the same hex as it. In le uh, though units and special structures are treated as a square for fire purposes, they're still going to be assaulted from adjacent hex sides. Okay. That's just kind of a special case thing being spelled out. When firing on enemy units attempting to assault at a square, uh, the fire value is determined by its target. Um, if it's all cav, you total the increments. All increments are totaled by nature of it resting in the hex with the care. Okay, because when Cav attacks you, you're allowed to fire all your strength points. And I think the reasoning behind that is that the Cav is going to be circling around the square trying to, uh, trying to harass it and maybe bust it up or something. I don't know. And against infantry, only a third because you're being assaulted from one direction only. Um, your morale is going to be increased by six. Base 10. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> now, we have no idea what melee is like, but now we have special rules for infantry assaulting a square. Um, so you end your movement adjacent to it. You get an assault marker to indicate that you're going to go in. The square will get its defensive fire, followed by the attacker giving offensive fire. Uh, the square gets its pre-morale, its pre-melee morale. Check. If this is successful, then the attacker checks his morale. And this sounds a lot like NBS here. Um, and is not special to the square. We're trying to find where things are special to the square. If the square fails the check, it disorders away as if it's normal. Um, and it'll move half its movement. Yeah. It would be helpful if we had the melee rules and then, hey, here's a special case if you're in square. And here have something that indexes into that. But no, that's not how the rules are written, of course. Um, if the defender and attacker pass their pre-morale checks, then the assaulting units actually move into the hex with the square. You do melee. If the square is forced to retreat, then all increments lost to it for retreating through an enemy zone of influence are doubled. And it's going to be special for the square. If the square holds the hex, then the attacking units have to displace back. Um, into the hex if they have not already been forced to retreat. Okay, artillery stacked with the infantry in the square. It combines its defensive fire with the infantry. The printed fire strength of the artillery will be divided by three because it's distributed about the square. And it can fire at normal range during offensive fire segment, but at a third of its strength. And it can combine its fire when conducting offensive fire, but only if the target units in the hex with the square are adjacent to it. Um, and you'd be able to do the three fire attacks in that case. Uh, and you could do some fire adjacent and some fire at further range. <coughs> and I assume you try to figure out some kind of firing arc that works for that, not provided in the rules. Uh, cav and infantry assaulting a square. When cav assaults a square during a melee, a cheval, let's not call it a charge or anything like that, uh, it does so with a third, and that may be actually something special, of its printed melee strength. It may not double this if it charged three he hexes in a straight line. Well, it would be nice to know these rules before, you know, we get into the specifics of this, but... Infantry that assaults a square has its melee strength increased by half. Uh, just because uh, the positioning, a square is really terrible uh, against an infantry attack, but it's very effective against cap. All right, square and maneuver. A square has a, m a movement potential of one hex with all around facing. Uh, so they're going to be mobile enough to move a hex, which I find a little weird, but... They can't assault, at least. Yeah. 
If they change formation out of square as their first action, they can move the rest of their movement potential minus the formation change. So far we don't have a cost for formation change. It may not be written in the rules, we don't know, but we assume it will be. <coughs> uh, if infantry and square suffer casualties sufficient to drop the number of infantry... Okay. Um, sufficient to drop the number of infantry to less than three, then the infantry in the hex changes its formation to column. And somewhere or another you're not allowed to create a square if you don't have at least three increments. You'd think it, here it is, yeah. I was gonna say, you'd think it would be in the base rule. And it is. Uh, this doesn't cost movement potential, it's done kind of automatically. And it doesn't trigger any fire. Road column. So you can only do this if you're on a defined road-like thing. Uh, it'll get a road column marker showing that the units are in road column. You can only have four increments per hex in road column. A unit has to be broken down into its smallest presentation, i.e. Okay, presentation in this case means if I'm a regiment, I might have to break down into my two uh, battalions there. Um, I think presentation meant something else somewhere else, but I'm not sure. Limbered artillery is always in road column if it's moving from one road trail or highway to another, and it doesn't need a special marker. The melee value of units in road columns are printed value of the unit divided by the proportion of increments of the unit in the hex, which is to say, and the, so they don't tell you how to represent a unit that's spread out, do they? It doesn't appear that they do. Um, I will probably use some sort of informational counters to stretch a road column out. Uh, but anyway, because you're only allowed four increments per hex, and some of these smallest units are bigger than fours, they're going to take up more than one hex. And you know, I'll use techniques from other games to represent that. Uh, so then your actual melee strength will be proportional to the amount of the unit that's in the hex on the road. <clears throat> and they, instead of stating this clearly, uh, again, they go around, so they go, uh, they, they, they say what they said, a melee unit is the printed unit divided by the proportion of increments of the unit in the hex. Now, they haven't really said that the unit can span multiple hexes anywhere. But that's got to be assumed because then the example, a cavalry regiment with 12 increments, is deployed in a road column in three hexes. One third of the regiments is in each hex. So we take a third of its melee strength and that's what's in each hex. This is the kind of picayune type stuff in terms of having to calculate a bunch of stuff out um, that feels very much like a minis game. It makes a lot of sense in a minis game because you have figures, right? So I might be only allowed one figure per road space or two figures per road space, depending on, you know, the frontage that they, they present. So that all becomes very obvious and it's very clear what I have facing. And my melee strength is probably calculated by the number of figures. But here they're trying to simulate that, all that kind of... There's a certain dross to it when, when you look at it as a minis game in terms of, wow, you know, that's maybe a little more specific than it needs to be, etc. But instead of taking advantage of some of the facets of um, a hex-based game and just giving some modifiers or something, they try to pretend that there's like, you know, actual figures here or something that they're representing it with. And it's just not what a, a hex and, and counter game is best at representing. You're better off playing the minis if that's the kind of, you know, situation you want. And you don't need minis to play minis, right? You can use little pieces of paper like this as your figures or whatever and play it on a map. 
Um, uh, of course, it would take a huge map to play something that represents at the level I'm talking about, but that's the level that minis usually are played at, and they're trying to reproduce that on a much, much smaller table space. Yeah, I know, it looks huge, but it really is so much smaller than what you'd see in, you know, a minis game of this scale would be tremendously large. Anyway. Oh, where are we? The fire value is going to be the printed fire value of the unit divided by the number of hexes it's deployed in, which is very weird because you're already in column, which means your frontage is already smaller than it's normally going to be, probably. And now they've divided that up more, and that doesn't even feel correct, but anyway. Uh, unit and column may not assault. Yeah. If it is assaulted, its morale takes a six-point penalty. If it's a target of a charge, it has its morale modified by 12. And this is how they write it. Instead of a six-point penalty, a si it's modified by six for the worse. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but limbered artillery are not modified. They just route when charging cav becomes a adjacent. Okay. Now, hopefully that's not the only place that rule is listed is placed, but we don't know. We really don't. I don't remember seeing it anywhere else. Uh, road column and maneuver. If you're in good order, you can enter road column. Uh, any combat unit that has more than four increments, okay, must enter road column in at least two hexes, with the maximum number of increments per hex of four. So there they kind of say it, and here they go into it more. Arrange the road column informational markers behind the unit counter to show the excess hexes. So they do eventually spell it out. Uh, it just should be done before it's, you know, referenced. But in there, I'm being kind of picky. Uh, an infantry battalion with 11 regiments would thus blah, 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 blah. And remember, a leader is required to uh, create a stack. So it's possible that you might have some overlap where... You know, maybe I've got three increments of one unit in a hex, and I can put an extra increment of another unit in there. <sighs> yeah. There's too much precision for uh, the type of game that it is, really, it, because it doesn't lend itself to it. A unit in road column pays half a movement point for each contiguous road hex entered. For trail and highways, see the movement chart. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't know where that is. Hmm. There we go. So let's see what we're looking at. City streets are a half. Roads and highways are a half. Sunken roads, this is the cost to cross them rather than to travel down them. I don't see any trails. I thought there were. There's so many different types of road in here, though. With slightly raised, slightly depressed, you know. <clears throat> okay. You cannot force march in road column. If you move off the road but remain adjacent to it, you become... Colon de route. What? Uh, all right, this is a march column. Oh, thanks for giving me the English. Wouldn't it have been useful to keep it in that in one language? I don't know. Uh, this is the same as road column, except the unit need not be on a road trail or highway, but has to stay adjacent to it. it keeps a road column marker. Um, a march column is a road column, but it's adjacent to the road and not on it. All the rules on a road column pertain, except that they pay normal terrain costs for the non-clear terrain they pass through. What do they pay for the clear terrain? Yep, half movement point for clear terrain, however, because they're using the road to guide their, their movement. Okay. Advantages, the unit can change automatically from march column to road column if it moves onto an adjacent road. Yeah, this is not that big a deal, right? Uh, but what it can do is it means you could actually move 
three columns of units together. Now, whenever they come to a choke point in the woods or whatever, they're going to have to filter through that. But uh, you might actually be able to pulse them through in such a way that nobody actually gets delayed terribly by it, which is, of course, unreasonable. But ah, uh, la 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 la. All right, I think we'll stop here with skirmishers. Probably gonna get through maneuver. That's 15 so far out of only 30 pages. So it's gonna be slow going going through these rules because I've read them, but they didn't sink in. Nothing. There are things that kind of sit as holes where I'm like, how does that work exactly? But for the most part, it works as you'd expect in the general thing. It's just there's some little specifics that it's like. All right, just how does that work? And that's going to be tough to remember. But honestly, a game like this kind of plays itself. It's just how much rules look up is there going to be involved in trying to get it, you know, to conform to the actual rules that are being used.